You got the phone on? Okay. I think that's everything. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Today, I want to continue chatting with you about being Christ's nature. That is his grace. God and nature continued. Who am I in Christ? One who has a good confession. And as disciples and believers, we must know what this is. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, giving you glory and honor. We come before you, praising and magnifying your name, glorifying you, lifting you up, and thanking you for all that you have already done, that in which you're going to do, and that which you're currently doing. We just bless you and we praise you and we say hallelujah to the most high precious God. We thank you for your word, for your word is mm -hmm, good. And we just thank you, Father God, that you entrust us to be able to not only be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. Let not one individual leave their devices in the same manner which he or she has entered, but let there be renewness of life one that will cause us all to open up our Bibles, to become closer unto you, even to become one with you. And we shall forever give you the glory and the honor. We shall forever magnify your name and glorify you. Who am I in Christ? One who has a good confession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. To God be the glory. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. Listen, as I have always said, and I always open up with this. I want you to understand that God's word is full of symbolism and representation. Now, in the anchor scripture that I'm about to read to you, please know that God is specific as to, as to what we, as his sons and daughters of Christ, must confess. He is specific towards this. Um, and I want you to know that all scripture that I'll be reading unto you today will be out of the New King James Version. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, that uh, you understand and know that. First, note that a confession is a formal acknowledgement of guilt by the person accused. Let me say that again. <laughs> a confession is a formal acknowledgement of guilt by the person accused. And I want you to hold that thought. But I also want you to know that a confession is a formal profession of belief. In this case, knowledge, because we are in a new covenant, and acceptance of doctrine before being admitted into a sovereignty, right? So it is a profession of belief. Knowledge, that is, and acceptance of doctrines before, before being admitted into a sovereignty. Now, testifying is from witnessing, as I indicated to you last week. While confessions are made with the mouth and are from the heart. That is why we must also live our confessions. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 3 states this. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart, to God be the glory. Therefore, we are doers, right, of our confessions, meaning that we walk in the knowledge of it or of them. In other words, we live from the heart, that is from the inside out and not from the outside in. I want you guys to stay with me now. Now to be good from God's perspective is to be godly. Let me say that again, to be good from God's perspective is to be godly. And listen, saints, we want to do everything from God's perspective, mm -hmm. not from our own perspective, because we have no perspective of our own when it comes according to the word of God. It's all taken from God's perspective. And I think that's where we kind of miss it, because when we start taking it from our own perspective, we kind of get lost. But we always know God's perspective, because in his word, he what? He describes what his perspective is. So stay with me here. Now, 
To be good from God's perspective is to be godly. And as I have said to you in the past, our desire should be to live from God's perspective and not from our own perspective, right? We should see things as Christ sees them. Mark 10, 17 through 18 says this, quote, now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do? What shall I do that I may inherit the kingdom of God? Or in other words, may I inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. So from God's perspective, good is being godly. Therefore, who am I in Christ? One who has a godly confession. I want you to stay there with me. One who has a godly confession. And all of our confessions should be of God. Turn with me to 1 Timothy, our anchor scripture, 6, and I'm going to read from 11 to 16. Stay with me here. Now, 1 Timothy 6 and 11 says this, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. I want you to do this for me. First note that Christ through Timothy is speaking to his brethren or to the sons of God. We may say today the sons and daughters of God, but he is speaking to his brethren by when he says, quote, but you, O man of God. In other words, he is speaking directly to us. Yes. Hmm? And if you make it personal, he is speaking directly to you yes. and he is speaking directly to me. So in that quote, when he says, but you, O man of God, you can just substitute that with your name on, because man. it's personal. He is telling us to flee the things that are aforementioned in the scriptures before this one. As sons and daughters of the most high, we are to flee, what? Greed and riches. God be the glory. Yes. Stay with me here. We are to flee greed and riches that can lead to lust, which is not of God. Note, I did not say wealth. Stay with me, guys. Mm -hmm. I did not say flee wealth, for wealth is spiritual and riches are natural. I can be wealthy without being rich, to God be the glory, which I am. Yes. <laughs> but let me put it to you this way. When you are in Christ Jesus, there isn't a want for anything because he has provided everything we need for life and godliness. Now that's wealth. Stay with me here. Second Peter 1, 1 through 3 says this, quote, Simon Peter, a bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the what? Knowledge. See, we have to have knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Amen. Lord. One of the things that is so profound here is that Christ separates Jesus he separates the knowledge of God, which is the triune God, from his son, Jesus. See, we have to have knowledge of both. But here's the thing that we have to have knowledge that Jesus is. He is, as he says, and I'm going to quote it, you know, peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord as his divine power. See, we got to understand that Jesus is the divine power of God. Stay with me here. Has given us all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness. See, when you're in Christ, that's where your wealthy place is. Stay with me here. Through the knowledge, and how do we have this wealth? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue to God be the glory, by which has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. There is our wealth, y'all. Great and precious promises. Who do you believe this day? Come on. I believe <laughs> the report of the Lord. <laughs> That's where my wealth is. That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Understand that in the kingdom, there's love 
in the world, there's lust. Two are separated. I want you to understand this. Understand that lust of anything can be greed for everything. Let me say that again. Lust for anything can be greed for everything. For greed is an excessive desire for natural possessions. And lust is an overmastering desire or craving for that which is natural. You guys see where this is going? One is natural, the other is spiritual. In other words, greed and lust, let me say that again, greed and lust, they're natural. Understand from God's perspective, both can lead to our destruction and final spiritual ruin, which is the loss of our souls. Therefore, we are to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. In essence, we are to pursue God. Let me say this again, saints. We are to pursue God. First Timothy 6 and 12 says this, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on what? eternal life. That's Christ, y'all, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. First, note this. Know that we are in a fight. Let me say that again. I want you to know that we are in a fight. And Christ is telling us that we are fighting for our faith. Yeah. Let me say that one more time. We are fighting for our faith. Please understand that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things, what? Unseen. Therefore, our faith is not seen by the natural eye. Okay. And the world, saints, the world, which is the environment that we are currently in, will tell us that we are living in fantasy land. Uh -huh. or that we are mentally disturbed. And Christ is telling us that we are a peculiar people in this world and that we are to fight against the weapons of the world so that no weapon it produces will prosper, right? And any tongue that rises up against us from it will be condemned. This is what Christ is telling us. That's the reason why we're peculiar, because we see things that the natural eye does not see, because we look at things from God's perspective with our spiritual eye. That, saints, is the good fight of faith. And the fight will allow us to lay hold on to eternal life. Therefore, currently, the question would be, what is our faith? Let me say that again. Currently. The question would be, what is our faith? Because our faith is not in the hope of a Messiah. He has come. God, we know he has come. Therefore, we have another faith that we are attaining to. And that is the return of our Jesus, the return of our Lord and Savior. This is our confession and our godly confession, which we live in the presence of many witnesses. That is the pursuit of God. See, I pursue him because yeah. I want him to return unto this place. My prayer is that he returns and he can return right here and right now to God be the glory. So I'm pursuing him with all that I have that he returns unto us to God be the glory. Note that our confession started off with admitting our guilt. Remember I said, hold that thought? Mm -hmm. I want you to note this, that our confession started off with admitting our guilt. You know, quote, Lord, I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. If that's not admitting guilt, I don't know what is. Then we profess our belief when we say, quote, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he died for my sins and you raised him to life. 
Understand that's a profession of belief. And this is how it starts. And then a profession of acceptance of his doctrine. Remember, this is what it's all about, our confession. I trust him as my Lord and will follow him as Lord from this day forward. And finally, we ask that he admits us into his sovereignty, which is his kingdom. You guys know Jesus is the kingdom. So we're asking him to admit us into him. Look, 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 look. When we say, quote, guide my life and help me to do your will. For his desire, saints, once again, is not one should perish, but all should come to repentance. This also says that we believe in his return if we admit that he is Lord over our lives. Yeah. To God be the glory. The many witnesses that watch is the world, saints. Remember, the world watches and the church judges. Remember, I told you that many, many, many months ago. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. The world watches while the church judges. The world watches how we live our lives and our lives must line up with our confessions. Remember, we talked about this. Now, 1 Timothy 6, 13 through 15, let me wrap it up. It says, quote, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is what? Appearance, that's his return, y'all, which he will manifest in his what? Own time. Stay with me here. He who is blessed and only pontinate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable life, whom no one has seen or can see to whom the honor and the everlasting power, amen. Understand that's faith, saints. That is faith because we see him, we know him because we have knowledge of him. Understand that this confirms our confession as giving the example by Jesus himself. Let me say it again. This confirms our confession as given the example by Jesus himself. Please note that Pontius Pilate is symbolic of the world. Mm. And the world watched and found no fault in Jesus. Hmm? Mm. You guys recall that? Let me say that again. The world watched, which is symbolic of Pontius Pilate, because the world had, to had a decision to make. But understand that the world found no fault in the Christ. Mm. The Jews, who are symbolic now of the church, judged the confessions of the Christ and found him guilty. Even unto death, Jesus's confession did not change. Even unto, uh, even unto separation from his father, his confession, Jesus's confession did not change. So why would we allow the world or the church to change our confession? Come on. He is returning soon. And my confession is that he returns now. This is our good or godly confession because God confessed it first. He, let me say this, Christ is blessed and only pontitate. Let me repeat that word, pontitate which means that he is the only person who possesses great power and authority. And in this case, he is a sovereignty because he is the kingdom and will manifest his return in his own timing. But, there is always a but here, but because he has given us back dominion of this place, stay with me here, saints, his timing does not preclude us from giving him an invitation to come back or to return to us and for us. Hallelujah. He will return in his own timing, but 
we extend the invitation for him to return now because we have dominion. In essence, we have got to want him to return. We have got to want him to return. But wait, I want you to watch this. Jesus, notice that Christ at this point calls us kings with a little K and lords with a little L, yes. right? You see that? Mm -hmm. This is very significant to the place of where we are currently. Remember, in last week's chat, the Lord told us, quote, let the unjust be unjust still and let the filthy be filthy My still. God. This, saints, is in reference to the world and to the church. Stay with me here. Please know that the world is unjust. Let me say that again. I want you to note that the world is unjust, but the church is filthy. Mm. Jesus, stay with me here. The church is filthy. Understand that we are justified through Jesus, but the filth does not come off until he returns to us. Jesus, Jesus. Let me say this again. The filth does not drop off from us because we accept him as our Lord and Savior. The filth is still there. Turn with me to Isaiah 64 and 6. King, New King James Version. Quote, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Okay, well, you say that's old covenant. We're in a new covenant. Well, turn with me to Romans 10. And we're gonna start at verse one. It says here, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, and you can substitute Israel in this for the church, for us, because this is during the new covenant, right? He's built his church. Israel now takes on the form of the church, right? My heart's desire for and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. See, understand that everyone in the family who so call themselves your kin are not your kind. Not everybody in the church is saved. Stay with me here. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to what? Knowledge. Understand here that you may have those of us that have a zeal for God. We may get happy in church, jump up and down, do cartwheels. We may even speak in tongues and do everything that it is in the natural sight of man that should be done or that we believe should be done in the presence of God in company. But when we go home, we have no knowledge of him because our worship is not of him, but of the enemy. So stay with me. He says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What you got to understand is that people are ignorant of God's righteousness because they're not taught. Come on, man. Jesus, you know, not all ministries teach about righteousness or about true worship, about how you're living. You guys understand that? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. But let me say this to you, that ignorance is not an excuse. Come on now. You understand? You cannot get before the father and say, father, I was ignorant of how I should have been living. Why? Because you have the same tool that I have and you do not need me to preach to you what this tool is saying to you. What you need is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that will lead God and direct you. It is the Spirit of God that will transform you through the Word of God. So I want you to stay here with me. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I see this all the time. People who say they love God, but in the next minute cussing me out like I was a 
<laughs> Let me just go on. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And that's what this is all about. How are we living? How are we submitting ourselves? Is part of that submission loving God and wanting him to return? Or is are we just giving lip service? To God be the glory. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? Believes. I can go on with that. But for the sake of time, I want us to turn to 2 Corinthians. Let me see. No, no. 1 Corinthians. To God be the glory. And this says it all, saints. This says it all. And this says what our faith is. And Christ holds back nothing through Paul when he's speaking to the Corinthians. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm going to start at verse 50. And this is what Christ says to us because it's personal. He says, now this I say, brethren. So understand first and foremost, Christ is talking to those who are his sons, who are his daughters, yes. those of us who are in the body, those of us who are his bride. This is what he's saying to us. See, Christ did not come here to speak to the world. Why? Because they're unjust. They're not listening anyway. God, <laughs> That's the reason why he says, let the unjust be unjust still. But he's speaking to those of us who are filthy. Hmm? Now I say this, brother, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There it is. If you're catering to your flesh and you're catering to your blood, it has nothing come, coming because it is death personified. Hmm? It's filthy. Hmm? I say this, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No matter what you do to it, no matter what it smells like, no matter what it looks like, it is death personified and it will not inherit the kingdom of God because it's filthy. So why live by it? And listen, saints, there are those of us in the church that still caters to the flesh and its nature. Look at what he says here. Nor does corruption inherit in corruption. So the filth that we carry on our what? Our very existence, this carcass that you now see that is projecting to you and talking to you, it will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because it's corrupt. It's corrupt because it's filthy. Oh, Jesus. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. And see, that's what it's all about, saints. Yeah. It's all about being changed. And he says, in a twinkling of an eye. See, I don't know about you, but I don't even want to carry this filth with me into heaven. I don't want to carry this filth with me when I come face to face with Christ. I want to, what, take off this incorruption and put on the corruption. And I want Christ to do it now. To God be the glory. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, come, Jesus, come. Let your trumpet sound and release our Lord and Savior, Daddy God, and let him come. Look, 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 for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and corruptible. Who to God be the glory. Look, 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 saints. We know we have some walking dead walking around here. Understand that, we're all walking dead because of this carcass that we carry. Yes. Look, 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 for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That's exciting. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited about that. And we shall be what? Changed. Why? Because we cannot allow this, he cannot allow this filth that we have and if anyone say to you, I don't know what this pastor is talking about because Christ has washed us clean. Yes, he's washed you clean from the inside, but not from the outside. God be the glory. And as long as you have the nature of flesh that is on you, around you, and in you, you're filthy. Just like I'm filthy. To God be the glory. In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Christ can't make it any plainer than that. And this mortal must put on immortality. The only way that we do that is by the return of Christ. We can't be sitting here saying, change me, change me, change me. But say, oh, we don't want you to come yet, though, Christ. We don't, well, no, 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 no. Change me after I live this life. No, 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 no. If you love him, it wouldn't matter. Jesus. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Don't you guys know that only through the return of Christ do we have the victory? Come on now. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Haiti, where is your victory? See, this that encompass us have no victory. It has no sting because pursuant, because us, Jesus, because with the return of Jesus, it is changed in a twinkling of an eye. Yes. As a matter of fact, I won't even feel it's passing. Come on, Jesus, now. Jesus, why, 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 why? Because death has no sting. This carcass has no sting. This filth that I have has no sting, right? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. We may not be sinners, but we happen to be saints who do sin. And if you think you don't sin, not even with a common thought or a what, or an article you read or a program you watch, you're sadly mistaken. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we have the victory to be overcomers of the world, which what we carry on our carcass through Christ Jesus. And that includes, saints, his return. Yes. Therefore, and this is the key, therefore, my beloved brethren, Look, 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 look. Understand that this is Christ speaking through Paul, first and foremost. Paul could not himself come up with this revelation unless Christ gave it to him yeah. and says, speak my word. I can't do it unless Christ has given it to me. He gives all the glory to Christ, to God. God, he gives all the glory to God. Why? Because God's word is his glory, and he's only repeating what his glory is telling him to repeat. So he says here, therefore, my beloved brethren, this is Jesus speaking to us. It is nice to know that even with a little L and a small K, I am still beloved by Jesus. Look, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Hmm immovable, immovable, always abiding in the work of the Lord. My God, my God, see, I am to be planted and can nobody take my confession away from me. I don't care who they are, they cannot take away my confession, and my confession is the return of my Lord and Savior. My faith is in his return. I have, I am part of the family of Christ. I have that. I know that the Messiah had come. That's the reason why I'm part of the family. But my desire is the same desire as my God, his father, is for his son to return to this place. So there'd be no more heartache, pain, and death. No more. And this is what we're to be steadfast on. 
This is what we're supposed to be immovable on. This is what we're supposed to be planted in. This is our faith that he shall and will return. That is the work of the Lord. God's work, the Lord's work is his coming back to us. He has a job to do. He has work to do. Just like the Holy Spirit is getting us ready. Look, 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 look. The Holy Spirit is getting us ready. He's transforming us back into his likeness and image. Because when the Lord comes back, he's got to be able to recognize himself. And if he recognizes himself, then we're taken up into glory with him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Only to return with him. Look, 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 look. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Knowing that my labor is not in vain. Lord says to set the captives free. How do we set the captives free? By encouraging the, the captives and letting them know the information that, hey, God is not done with us yet. He has not left us orphans, nor has he left us to defend on our own. He will return unto us. And when he returns unto us, look at what we will be gaining. We will be gaining life and leaving living for life abundant. Living is part of death. Life is part of eternity. And that is what we will have. That which we moan and groan for, which is all of creation for the return of Christ. That is what he's telling us to keep moving towards. Because our labor and our movement as being doers of his word, lining up with our confession and confessing the good confession and fighting the good fight of faith will not be done in vain. To God be the glory. Who am I in Christ? Ah, one who has a good confession unto God. To God be the glory forever and ever and ever. For those of you who desire to have a good confession, that is his church, that is his bride, then become part of the good news. Then become part of the good news that Christ is born, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will return. Then you want to repeat this prayer after me. I want you to say, God, I know that I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sins and that you raised him to life. I trust him as my savior and will follow him as Lord from this day forward. Guide my life and help me to do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Now, if you've just made that confession, I want you to know that you've also confessed his return from the day you said that you will follow him. That means that you're following him towards his return to us and for us. If you made this confession of faith, then understand that the angels of heaven, they are so rejoicing. Jesus has his arms extended wide for you to just flow right into them. And I am overjoyed that I have another brother and or sister in the kingdom of God. God be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I certainly pray that you receive something from this spirit side chat. I want you to know that Christ has us on a series of desiring for his return. And in every prayer that we pray, it should be for the return of Christ. 
because only his return will answer all things. Only his return will answer all prayer. And again, this is not the end of anything. We're merely praying for the beginning. If you believe as I believe, then there is no house, there are no cars, there's no money in the bank account, there is no children, there's no wives, there, there is no, no anything that will keep me and separate me from the desire of, him, of wanting him to come back to this place. He can take all of this because it all belongs to him and there's none of it that I can take with me to where I'm going. But if he comes back now, it'll put an end to viruses. It'll put an end to diseases. It'll put an end to high blood pressure, diabetes. It'll put an end to hate, to death to racism, it'll put an end to poverty. It'll put an end to those things that are unlike him. And that should be your desire for it is my desire Amen. to God be the glory. I want to let you know that next week we will not have a spirit side chat, but we will come back to you the week after that uh, for a, another spirit side chat. Um, I will miss you, but I love you. And, you know, that's only so that God can replenish me from the inside out. To God be the glory. I pray that uh, these messages go viral because the people of God need to know that it's not enough just to pray for our individual needs. We need to pray for his return. And that's universal. That will take care of the needs of everyone on this planet. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We praise you. We magnify your name. We glorify you. We lift you up and we simply say hallelujah to the most high precious God. We thank you, Father God, for us corporately coming together through these devices. We thank you for allowing us to share your word, in which you have entered into me uh, through your word that has down, been downloaded into everyone. We just glorify you and we praise you, Father God that we will be changed, Father God, not only from your return, but just by your word all by itself, entering into our life in this dispensation. We give you glory and honor, and we thank you, Father God, for showing us the way of how we ought to pray. And that is our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is praising and glorifying you and thanking you before we even get into prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is your, re that is your son returning unto us because he is the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It is your will that he returns on this earth as he did in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That is, do not neglect the feeding of your souls and of your spirits on a daily basis with the word of God. He has provided it for us. We need to take nourishment of it on a daily basis and renew our minds on a daily basis. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt. That is, forgive us of our sins as we forgive our debtors. That is to forgive those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is the return of Jesus in his deliverance. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you've made that declaration and you've made that prayer, know that you're praying for the return of Christ and you're giving God the glory for his return. And this is what Christ told us before he was even sent to the cross of how we ought to pray. So I bless you and I praise you and I thank you. And I look forward to seeing you the same time, the same place in two weeks. To God be the glory. Have prosperous weeks. I will see you in two weeks with another Spirit Side Chat. Be blessed and take care. Bye-bye.